Howard Tinder. Uh, I think you can probably hear Bristol. I co-teach and honor the seminar course with Dr. Weisberg, who's standing there. And we're very pleased to have you here for, uh, for all kinds of reasons. We have, we have a distinguished scholars to speak to us about a really important subject. Uh, and this represents a kind of an inauguration of our own for Holocaust College. Uh, we're, uh, we're official. And I, I think uh, we're all very pleased that we can bring you resources, various resources to this community. So it's just the beginning. Thank you all for your interest. Uh, our speaker today brings, uh, I think, uh, so many wonderful qualities to the subject of the show of the Holocaust. Um, especially interested uh, in the work that, uh, that really has to form the um, core of its scholarly inquiries, which has to do with uh, memory. Uh, the extent to which memory plays, the role that memory plays in, in, the, in how we represent the Holocaust. Let it be private memory, that is the memory of, of survivors, and the importance of recognizing uh, what survivors can contribute to our understanding of the, of the Holocaust. Uh, but also public memory, how we commemorate uh, this very complex uh, moment in time, uh, this moment full of public trauma. Our speaker is Professor James E. Young, Distinguished University Professor of English and Judaic Studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where he's taught since 1988. He's the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies at UMass Amherst. He received his PhD from Berkeley in 1983. Professor Young is the author of Writing and Rewriting the Holocaust, The Texture of Memory, which won the National Jewish Book Award in 1994, and At Memory's Edge, after images of the Holocaust in contemporary art and architecture. What is really remarkably fascinating, in addition to these scholarly accomplishments, is his work, in, as I say, in um, public commemoration of the Holocaust. In 1997, Professor Young was appointed by the Berlin Senate to sit on a commission uh, to uh, choose an architect for the National Memorial to Europe's murdered Jews. He has also consulted with Argent Argentina's government and its memorial uh, to those uh, who have been lost as well uh, in various conflicts. Most recently, he was appointed by the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation to the jury for the National 9 11 Memorial um, in uh, 2004, at which opened on September 11, 2011. His talk today is How Memory and the Negative Space Monument, the Cases of Berlin and New York. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I love the family connections here, uh, <clears throat> where uh, Howard's uh, daughter was a student of mine at UMass a few years ago, one of my greatest students of all time. It's fantastic. <clears throat> and uh, my wife's family actually um, comes from uh, New Bedford. And they are sending me to Sam's Bakery tomorrow morning to bring home meat pies <laughs> to, to Amherst. <laughs> so uh, she comes from an old uh, Syrian Jewish family. <clears throat> Fall River, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to be fantastic. <clears throat> so I've got a big order that I'll be bringing back with me to Amherst. <clears throat> um, as Howard said, uh, I was on the jury for the National 9-11 Memorial uh, Design Competition in 2003, actually. <clears throat> uh, we received uh, for that competition 13,800 registrations from 90 countries. You can also take that. Okay. And uh, yeah, put it over here. And eventually received 5,201 designs. <clears throat> from 62 countries and 49 states. Uh, it took us a long time, obviously, to go through them all. Um, it was a very, uh, you know, temporarily, we were still very close to the event, and all, all of us still really scarred, somewhat traumatized by it. Um, and eventually, we found a design uh, reflecting absence, <coughs> uh, designed by Michael Arad and Peter Walker. <coughs> which proposed uh, taking the footprints of the World Trade Center towers, now empty, <coughs> and uh, plunging down uh, 30 feet deep, uh, or gigantic ponds, and then going down another 30 feet in the center uh, 
of them to kind of void just to seem to go into the abyss. <clears throat> um, the plaza is filled with trees and an abacus grid so that from north south, <clears throat> it looks like a random grove of trees, but from east west, you get the city grid and you can see nice neat rows just as if you're looking down uh, the city streets in New York City. Um, it's a great design. Uh, it's been realized now. It's dedicated on the 10th anniversary uh, by President Obama. Um, uh, Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was there, and I got to show her through and explain uh, the design to her and why we chose it. Um, <clears throat> and it works. But when we unveiled the winning design at Federal Hall in January 2004, <clears throat> Um, we were allowed for the very first time to speak to the press. <clears throat> We'd been um, under a uh, contract not to speak to the press during the whole process until we'd chosen the design. And the first question I got <clears throat> was from a reporter who uh, knew uh, Rod's work very well and knew a lot of the architecture in Europe and said, so let's say you were on the jury in Berlin that chose Peter Eisenman's design for the Denkmal or the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. And now you're on this jury uh, choosing the memorial. And Daniel Liebeskind, who designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin, was chosen by the LMDC to be, to be the master site planner for the new World Trade Center site design. And now you've chosen Michael Arad, a young Israeli-born, but Jewish-based, uh, New York-based architect. <clears throat> this was a blind competition, by the way. Um, we didn't know until the last eight finalists you know, who the designers were. <clears throat> and, um, and you've chosen two gigantic voids in the footprints of the World Trade Center towers. Haven't you just basically chosen another Holocaust memorial? You know, which kind of yeah, it was slightly offensive at first, <clears throat> but then I began to think about it. And as I was formulating my answer, <clears throat> my mind went back to a moment when um, Maya Lin and I were giving a presentation at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. <clears throat> this would have been probably 1988. And uh, she had mentioned that um, in designing the Vietnam Veterans Monument in Washington, D.C., what I think is America's greatest 20th century monument, also a negative form monument, um, that in fact she was indebted to two memorials before her. One was a memorial in uh, Tipal in France, a memorial to the fallen soldiers of the Battle of the Somme in uh, <coughs> World War I. And the second was this memorial <clears throat> up here, uh, designed by Henri Pangouchon, uh, who designed also a negative form monument to the what they call the deportés, or the deported Jews of Paris, <clears throat> designed in 1959. <clears throat> so fairly early Holocaust memorial. And what struck her about this design in particular <clears throat> was um, its horizontality, as you see here. This isn't a big memorial that you go look up at. This is, this is a flat memorial. And in fact, to get there, you have to descend down a very narrow staircase. Somewhat oppressive, in fact. The designer wanted basically to <clears throat> take you out of the city of Paris <clears throat> and, and the, uh, on the Ile de la Cité, where this is located, in fact, it's the same island where Notre Dame, the Grand Cathedral, is. So you're literally, your back is to Notre Dame, and then you go down the stairway, and then you can see the spire of Notre Dame here be beside you. But basically, you're in this space to kind of remember by yourself. You're kind of underground. She's taken kind of the symbolic icons. <clears throat> uh, this, this artist, uh, architect, took some of these symbolic icons, these black triangles, suggesting barbed wire, but also suggesting the uh, triangles that the prisoners had to wear, and of course the Jewish prisoners of the camps had to wear two triangles, <clears throat> uh, sometimes uh, red for being a political prisoner, uh, with a yellow one uh, for being also a Jewish prisoner. And the only <clears throat> kind of window in this space is something you have to go down to, and this window is located it's almost in the, in the prow of the ship. This memorial juts into the River Seine. So from across the river, 
um, if you're sitting in a cafe looking at this memorial, all you see is kind of a big jutting elbow like that coming into the river. And the river kind of wraps itself around, almost like the prow of a boat. And she loves this memorial. <clears throat> and uh, it did something to her. It opened something up in her. And um, I would paraphrase her here. <clears throat> but she basically said that <clears throat> I knew when she was, she was saying, when I was a graduate student at Yale, <clears throat> that any memorial I ever designed <clears throat> was going to counterpoint all the very traditional triumphalist memorial designs. It's not going to be you know, high and mighty. It's going to be low and into the ground. It's going to be a wound, basically. And <clears throat> to paraphrase, she wanted to open up a place in the landscape that would open up a place within us who came to visit this memorial. <clears throat> open up a place in the landscape that would in turn open some, something up inside of us for memory. We would come to occupy that space. So this was her proposal for the Vietnam Veterans Monument. <clears throat> um, a, a, an open blind competition which received over a thousand submissions from around the world in 1979, fairly early after the Vietnam War was over. Um, she wanted to articulate the great ambivalence Americans felt toward remembering the Vietnam War, uh, the great ambivalence that Americans still felt, unfortunately, toward its uh, Vietnam vets. And um, she wanted to give the vets a place <clears throat> where they might ambivalently mourn their fallen comrades, fallen buddies in the war, 58,000 of them. And so she created this space in the landscape. And of course, when she first proposed this, the judges didn't know what they were looking at. <clears throat> and it was, took only one juror, stage after stage, kept pulling this design up until he, they got to kind of a handful of finalists. And then everybody said, OK, so explain to us what's going on here. And he read her, her beautiful um, accompanying narrative. And she said I, she wanted to cut into the earth, <clears throat> really cut into the earth and open the earth up. It's a wound. And the Vietnam War is kind of a wound in our national psyche. And we're trying to help it mend, but the wound still exists. So by cutting into the earth and then opening it up and then descending into it, she literally counterpointed the very traditional military monument that's not the jutting elbow, the very aggressive, sharp, weapon-like traditional architecture of a war memorial. But she did, instead of this, she did this. Instead of the jut, it was the open, into which we descend. It was an embrace, in a way, embraced by the landscape right there. And as you descend into it, as you know if you've been there, Washington, D.C. kind of disappears. <clears throat> Things become very quiet. The memorial itself is invisible from the road next door to it. And uh, people go up. You have one axis of the memorial points to the Washington Monument, and the other one points to the Lincoln Memorial. And of course, the memorial here is not meant to defeat the people who come, but is meant to reflect back to us um, human, humanly proportioned faces, our own faces, in fact. Um, she understands that memorials, in fact, always reflect back kind of our own projections, <clears throat> what we bring to them. What happens doesn't happen in the memorial. It happens between us and the memorial. The 58,000 engraved names are not engraved alphabetically, like a phone book, but engraved chronologically in the order in which the soldiers were killed or died during, during the Vietnam War. So they read historically, also a great innovation you know, by Maya Lin. And it does invite touching and people leaving flowers and, and medals and boots and bottles of Jack Daniels and all kinds of things that somehow unite these, uh, you know, the visitors with their lost family members or lost friends or buddies. And you know, continues to this day to be a memorial that, in the minds of a whole new generation of memorial designers, kind of broke something <clears throat> and opened up brand new possibilities. How to remember something nationally that you might even want to forget? <clears throat> How to remember a, a wound without completely mending it, but giving you a place inside to feel wounded by the memory here? It's an ambivalent memorial, and it's, it's meant to be. As a result, a whole new generation of German 
young German artists and memorial designers, um, have told me that within just a couple of years of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial being dedicated in 1981, um, they now felt that they had a vocabulary, a vernacular, for thinking about how to remember the Holocaust in Germany. <clears throat> how does a country like Germany remember a persecution like the Holocaust? How does a, a country like Germany um, remember a mass murder con committed in its national name? How does a country like Germany reunite itself on the bedrock memory of its national crime? Nobody's ever done that before. In this country, where were the memorials to slavery? In the Middle Passage on the National Mall, on the National Mall where slave auctions were actually held for, for decades. You know, slaves sold in their pens on the National Mall within sight you know, of the White House and our great monuments. Not even a pebble for years. Now we finally have a National Memorial, or National Memorial Museum to African American history. But nothing, nations never build themselves or their national memorial legacies on the memory of national crimes. But now Germany was asking itself to do this. America has begun to ask itself how to do this. And uh, Maya Lin kind of broke the wood that allowed this whole generation of, on both sides of the Atlantic to do this. This memorial pro uh, was proposed. <clears throat> this is, of course, the Brandenburger Tor, the Brandenburger Gate in Berlin. <clears throat> but when Germany held a gigantic uh, international memorial competition for what it was calling its National Memorial to Europe's Murdered Jews, to be cited in this you know, central Berlin square, <clears throat> uh, artist Horst Hoheisel proposed taking the Brandenburger Tor, the national monument, and blowing it up. <clears throat> you know, how better to remember destroyed people than by destroying the national monument <clears throat> of the country that destroyed that people? Remember one destruction by another destruction, he said. Don't remember this terrible destruction by yet one more edifice, one more construction. Emptiness, void, loss must be now remembered by emptiness, void, and loss, is what this artist was saying. And of course, he was also saying that he knew this would never be built. The country wasn't about to blow up the Brandenburger Tor at all. But he said he wanted basically to throw this idea out that maybe, in fact, there can't be any single national memorial to the Holocaust you know, in Berlin. So he said, blow it up and then spread the pieces um, you know, of the Brandenburger Tor and then cover them all over with these great granite plates. <clears throat> and um, in the end, the monument will be those who come remembering and stand in this big open square. So remember, this is now, this is 1995 when he proposed this. In 1986, <clears throat> just uh, really about four years after uh, Vietnam Veterans Monument was uh, dedicated, Another two artists uh, won a commission in Harburg in Germany to design a, uh, what was called a memorial against fascism and for peace, kind of a, a complicated term that meant to be a Holocaust memorial uh, in Hamburg. They proposed taking this 12 meter tall lead covered pillar <clears throat> and in the little inscription to it, it said, we invite the citizens of Harburg and visitors to the town to add their names here to ours. In doing so, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant as more and more names cover this 12 meter tall lead column. It will be gradually lowered into the ground. One day it will have disappeared completely and the site of the Harburg monument against fascism will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. It's a great formulation, and in this formulation, of course, they, they countermand all the traditional you know, memorial conventions. <clears throat> Instead of remaining permanent, it disappears. Instead of remaining inviolate, it invites our own participation, our own writing and carving into it. It goes away so that in the end, only we ourselves can rise up against injustice. These artists worried that, in fact, we might be making memorials to substitute for our own actions against contemporary injustice. Rather than substituting for action, maybe the burden of memory should be returned to us, standing in these now empty sites. We need to remember. Our monuments don't really remember for us. They provide space for us to remember. And the Jochen Gerrits and Esther Shalov Gerrits, his then wife, uh, suggested that Maya Lin had opened this possibility up to them opening a space for memory, not 
closing it off with a big rock or a big stone or a big pillar, but open that space up so that we are left behind. And this memorial, of course, is also a process. <clears throat> People came, and every time they would fill up kind of a meter and a half section of the wall with uh, their inscriptions. At first, they wrote their names, but before long, of course, it became kind of a bit of a trap for graffiti, and people would take ice picks and stab it in and kind of pull the lead away. And, and the city, Hamburg, uh, was now a little upset, and they said, you know, maybe we should just get rid of this. <clears throat> the artist said, we're getting rid of it. Just, that's, that's the point. He goes, but it's kind of a, it's an eyesore. And uh, the artist answered simply, well, isn't any monument basically just a screen onto which the community projects its preoccupations? And if, isn't a swastika, too, a kind of a signature? If that's what they're going to write here, let everybody see it. You can't get rid of it. That, too, is what people are remembering here. And so it's, it is a bit of a trap and a bit of a mirror being held up to the community, very ambivalent one. So between 1986, when it was dedicated, and 1993, in its final sinking, it had some 12 different um, ritual sinkings where the mayor would come out and the TV cameras would come out. And the artists would take great mischievous delight watching one of Germany's Holocaust memorials disappear. For them, this embodied this very ambivalent relationship Germans would necessarily have. <clears throat> about remembering the Holocaust, how to remember something they'd rather forget, like creating a monument that goes away. Sure enough, it did disappear. Now, <clears throat> this is a counter monument. <clears throat> this, isn't, um, this is meant to challenge traditional monumentality. Um, and I'm not here to say that it's the best kind. Um, there are all kinds of memorials. Germany has thousands of memorials in every town. Um, you have really every point of deportation is marked in some ways. But this ge generation of German artists is very suspicious of monuments in general as what they call, they, they believe is kind of a, an authoritarian kind of art. Gigantic monoliths telling people what to think, towering over visitors and making them feel very small and insignificant. They remind us that Nazi Germany, in fact, venerated monumentality for making the people feel very small and insignificant. Individuals did not matter. Even their gigantic uh, rallies, you know, the Nuremberg um, rallies, where you know, 600,000 people would come together, the point was that it would be a whole body. The individual didn't matter. It was this whole mass, this monumental mass of people was all that mattered for, the, for Nazi Germany. Hence, the new generation's great suspicion of anything reeking of monumentality. Get rid of the monuments. <clears throat> um, Jochen Gerrits was actually a, uh, an artist who did lots of self-erasure. He said that art should not live outside of us. Once somebody has seen the art, it goes inside, and they take it away with them in their hearts and in their hearts' minds. You know, he preferred art that self-destructed once it was you know, viewed by, by spectators. So in 1991, Jochen Geertz was appointed to uh, the Institute of Fine Arts in Saarbrücken, where he was a professor of art and uh, taught a class on monuments. Here he uh, asked the class to take a vow of uh, silence and secrecy. Uh, half the class was ordered to go into the streets of Zarbrücken and to steal cobblestones from around the street, um, and, then and then go down to this plaza here in Zarbrücken, the um, uh, Zarbrücker Schloss, which was a castle which was the head of Gestapo uh, headquarters in, uh, during the war, and uh, take up cobblestones here, replace them with the ones you've stolen, bring the cobblestones from the square up to the classroom where the rest of the class was researching all the names and places of destroyed Jewish cemeteries in Germany, uh, 2,162 of them, um, destroyed between 1933 and 1945. And then they carved the names of these destroyed Jewish cemeteries <clears throat> into the rocks, into the cobblestones, and then they return them to the square. It's a process, stages of memory, education. But of course, um, this is Jochen Gertz's project, so they return the cobblestones inscribed side down so that there's no record of the entire operation. <clears throat> it's now called the Square of the Invisible Monument. And uh, they announced what they'd done. The town, townspeople came down to see where this was. 
I said, well, where is it? And the students replied, you know, no doubt a little arrogantly, um, look within yourselves for the memory you search here. You bring the memory. You know, the memory, you are standing on the memory. The only standing forms on this square are the people. The only vertical forms, otherwise completely horizontal. Look within yourselves. And again, is this the only kind of memorial there should be? No. You need conventional memorials to counterpoint. So there's a, a dialogue between these kinds of memorials. Horst Holheisel, who had uh, proposed in 1995 to blow up the Brandenburger Tor, had proposed this memorial for Kassel in 1986, exactly the same time the Gerzes were doing the disappearing monument. He proposed, um, they wanted to rebuild this uh, kind of a little neoclassic uh, fountain which had been donated to the town of Kassel by a Jewish philanthropist in 1911 but which was destroyed as what they called the Jews' fountain by uh, Nazi you know, hooligans in 1938 <clears throat> and um, turned into what they called Ashrot's grave. Ashrot, Sigmund Ashrot was the name of the philanthropist who donated it. So they just wanted to rebuild it and Horst Hoheisel said, don't rebuild it, take the original form which he's taken here, turn it upside down into the ground. And instead of water coming up out of it, surrounded by water, you would now have water down beneath reflecting back the shape of this neo-Gothic pyramid. And he said that instead of allowing you know, the thing to be repaired and replaced as if nothing happened, since as we know everything happened, we will now commemorate absence with absence. Um, you, you can look down into this, water fills that little channel and flows down. And he goes, I want this to become a pedestal not a monument, but a place where people coming to look for the memory of what happened here find themselves. And he's saying this in 1986, exactly the same time the Gertzes are saying, you know, look within yourselves. So it's just part of the um, zeitgeist of that moment between 81 and 86 when these artists are thinking in these terms. And this, thus was born this whole generation of what I end up calling counter monuments throughout, throughout Germany, challenging monuments. And of course, these memorials ended up influencing all kinds of other memorials. And as you're going to see, you know, all of this is rushing through my mind while I was still trying to answer that question about the, you know, the, the big voids and uh, the ground zero. Um, and I'm thinking of all of these. <coughs> um, this is the book, book burning memorial in the Babelplatz in Berlin. Uh, Misha Ullmann, Israeli uh, artist, commissioned to make the book burning memorial. And um, once again, he's preoccupied by what's missing. <clears throat> he goes, I'm not going to try to replace or compensate what was lost you know, with something beautiful, and some beautiful piece of art. Instead, he said, uh, we're going to show that what was lost cannot be replaced. <clears throat> so he's taken in this square, uh, on the far, on the left here, you see a, a, a steel uh, tablet engraved with uh, the history of the, of the Nazi book burnings in 1933 and 34 that took place here. And then there's another tablet uh, which quotes Heinrich Heine, the great German Jewish poet who once wrote, where books are burned, so one day too will people be burned as well. And in between, you have a kind of a, a glass window <clears throat> that looks down into a room of empty bookshelves. <clears throat> Uh, destroyed books can't be replaced. Emptiness now remembered by emptiness. Absence remembered by absence. Loss remembered with loss. And as people go to look, of course, they become the only standing forms in the square looking down into this room of empty shelves. It just so happened when I was working um, on the jury on the Berlin Memorial, uh, going from my hotel every day to where we met, I had to walk through this square. And so I passed over this every, every day looked down into this, and then went on to my work. Uh, Rachel Whiteread, um, English, a British artist, uh, proposed also something called Bibliotheque, or library, uh, for Vienna. <clears throat> and um, I've written about this, but I think I'm going to um, skip on. Um, her, her vernacular is using material as in what she calls an index of absence. <clears throat> so she's created in this memorial uh, uh, it's almost a, um, a crypt which seems to be concrete articulating the space between the leaves of a book and the wall in a library. It's like taking a library and turning it inside out. 
where space now finds materiality. Uh, Shimon Ati, an American artist, uh, then living in San Francisco, moved to Berlin in 1991, where he was struck by what he didn't see anywhere. Um, no sign of a Jewish community left in Berlin. So he researched in archives and found hundreds of photographs of um, kind of Ostjuden, or Jews from the East, who had lived in this quarter, uh, the Schoenenviertel in, in Berlin, where they, um, <clears throat> these images of uh, kind of old uh, Hebrew booksellers and, and uh, Jewish bakeries. He took these pictures, turned them into slides, and then at night without telling anybody, he went back and projected these slides back onto their original places in Berlin to reanimate these otherwise empty spaces with what had once been there. And the images are quite stunning. They're quite beautiful. But it suggests, <clears throat> this palimpsest, it su suggests that if you pull the facade away, you will reveal what had once been here. And he's also suggesting that what we see in these sites is always going to be projected by what we know. So he's projected this image. As long as the light shows, it's there. He hopes that when he turns that slide off, or the projection off, that once people had seen that, they will always see that there. And so it's his way to remind otherwise what he calls amnesiac sites, uh, remind them of the memory that they should have or once had. So we're going to skip then to 1997. <clears throat> the 1995 memorial competition in Berlin uh, <clears throat> ended up failing. Um, 526 submissions uh, from around the world yielded a, a kind of a terrible winning design chosen by a committee composed of the Bundestag, the Berlin Senate, and a Citizens Initiative Committee. The 15 jury members chose a, a big slab of concrete inscribed with 4.2 million names of Jewish victims scattered with 18 boulders from Masada in Israel. None of it makes sense. Well, we only have 4.2 million names, even though we know there's about, you know, there were nearly 6 million victims. They chose it because they just couldn't agree on anything else. And uh, then Chancellor Helmut Kohl looked at it. I wrote an op-ed piece. Uh, dozens of people wrote op-ed pieces against it. And at that point, I said, uh, you know, I don't think there should, be, there should be a central memorial. Let there be no memorials. <clears throat> Let there just be a process. So um, they held these symposia. Um, I spoke at one of them. Um, about 2,000 people in the audience. It was like this, this time of horrible angst. Um, the debates were embarrassing for them. There was huge anger and bitterness that they, you know, that here they're trying to commemorate the Holocaust dutifully, but they can't arrive at anything, they can't agree on anything. And I said simply that, you know, maybe it's better to have a thousand years of Holocaust memorial competitions than any final solution to your memorial problem. That so uh, you're trying and you may never get there, and it's okay, just follow the process, don't worry about the end result. And um, <clears throat> so I came home and I got a call the next day from the Speaker of the Berlin Senate who asked if I would then join a jury for a new competition. And I said, well, I don't think it should be done. He goes, precisely because you don't think it can be done, we want you to help us do it. And I couldn't resist kind of the Hegelian logic in this, the dialectic. <laughs> okay, but as long as we have room maybe not to recommend anything, if we don't find anything, then we will not recommend anything. It says, yeah, whatever you do. So they gave us complete license. We ended up uh, in a completely new process. Uh, they allowed us to invite only 25 teams of artists and architects. Um, we were five. Uh, we each chose five. Um, among those I chose was uh, Rachel Whiteread and James Terrell, among others, Daniel Liebeskind, um, Peter Eisenman. Anyway. We had three finalists. This was won by Daniel Liebeskind, the architect of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, um, also the site planner, by the way, for Ground Zero. Uh, Liebeskind proposed uh, this series of broken segments of a wall, uh, which we did like, but we didn't like that he was also the designer of the Jewish Museum, and now he might possibly be the designer of the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. We didn't want one architect, one Jewish architect, yeah, based in Berlin, doing all of this work. 
but we liked this design, and because it was it was broken, it was about loss, it was about absence. Um, his design and for the Jewish Museum in Berlin is built on a series of six voids, and he said that one of the voids has extended itself all the way to this site. You know, and what's nice about his model was that it shows the uh, <clears throat> well. You, it's hard to see here, but I mean. He, You've got um, the Reichstag up at the upper left. You've got the Brandenburger Tor kind of in the middle above. And then you've got this space, and you've got Potsdamer Platz kind of behind me here. So we didn't choose this, but we liked it. We liked that it overran the boulevard there, and the little corner uh, on, the, on the left went right into the Tiergarten, right to Goethe's uh, bust. This one we liked a lot, and we actually voted this one first <clears throat> in a divided vote <clears throat> um, by Gesine Weinmiller, a young uh, German architect, and I liked that very much. I didn't actually like the idea of choosing an American. I, I wanted to choose a German to do a, make a German monument. <clears throat> and uh, she proposed taking 18 segments of a wall, gigantic ones composed of these limestone blocks about the size of the limestone blocks of the Western Wall in Jerusalem, arranging them randomly down into the square. You can see the influence of Maya Lin here. So you descend into the square. The city would kind of disappear. City noises would kind of get quiet. <clears throat> and, um, and you would wander in and out of these, uh, you know, the, these, these segments. <clears throat> but then we noticed as we walked along this parapet and going from left to right, and we got to that corner on the far right, and looking down into the plaza, we could suddenly see that these random segments of wall actually composed themselves into a broken star. And as we kept walking, they fell apart. It's part of a, a perspectival illusion. And it was intentional, but she didn't want to tell anybody about it. She wanted everybody to come upon this themselves, which we did. But then we worried that it might be a gimmicky. And, you know, and what if that's all people wanted to find when they came here? And so we had qualms about this as a, another competition. Um, finally, we chose uh, Peter Eisenman <clears throat> and Richard Serra's design of, of originally proposed 4,200 Stelle covering this entire five acre, you know, 20,000 square meter expanse right in the middle of uh, Berlin. Um, <clears throat> these Stelle would range from ground level to as high as 27 feet high. Uh, we like this. Um, we know Richard Serra's work. He's really a, probably America's greatest kind of sculptor right now. Eisenman, very well-known American architect. Um, so we proposed this is the winner. But we did send them back to the drawing board. <clears throat> uh, we asked them to go back and scale it down, that it was too bombastic. And we were afraid, frankly, that it was going to be dangerous. We, we could see kids running out over the tops of these and falling in. And uh, we could see people getting lost. I mean, remember, these, these, some of these are like 27 feet high, only uh, barely, basically this wide, 93 centimeters apart, about the, just a wide enough for one human being to come through. All of them three degrees off plumb. So we asked them to scale it down. This was the site before the memorial was installed. A lot of people like this big void. This is a placard that was at this site, which is very interesting. Before 1989, of course, the uh, wall, Berlin Wall, ran right through this site, right around the Brandenburger Tor, which was in East Germany. On the right-hand side was West Germany. And this site was actually no man's land. It was a minefield, literally a minefield, <clears throat> um, with barbed wire. It was a place where people had tried to escape from East Germany, you know, climbing over the wall here where they were shot. <clears throat> um, so when the wall came down in 89, it became kind of prime real estate, and, be, and there was nothing there. So Helmut Kohl decided this would be a good place for the National Memorial. So Peter Eisenman went back and redesigned it and uh, scaled it down and made the, the Stelle, these pillars, much smaller. And we liked that, but Richard Serra didn't like it. He said, well, um, if you scale it down, then it's no longer mine. I make big, dangerous things, my, my gigantic um, torqued ellipses out of court Corten steel. And sometimes they do fall on the workmen installing them. And people even die putting them up. And I go, well, that's great. But we actually don't want something literally dangerous. We don't mind something suggesting danger and something suggesting ominousness. And we don't mind people feeling a little threatened by memory, but not literally threatened with their 
you know, with their lives. So Richard Serra left the project, leaving it to Eisenman, who was quite happy to be on his own. And this is what was, in fact, installed. These are the early models. <clears throat> this is when it was under construction. Um, it became politically a, a huge football, um, back and forth. Uh, a, we selected this in uh, 1997. It went to the parliament. Uh, there were elections held then in 98. Um, Helmut Kohl was in CDU. You know, we didn't do this politically. He just happened to be the chancellor when we were asked to do this. But when the elections came, <clears throat> the uh, head of the, the SPD, the, the Social Democratic Party, <clears throat> uh, Schroeder, decided that this was Kohl's project. He wanted to throw it out altogether and start over. He said, let's not have a memorial. Let's just have a big library. And his culture minister, Michael Nauman, agreed. And so that's what they thought they were going to do. <clears throat> and so then it became an, an election issue. <clears throat> and so we were asked um, just before the election, um, what is your final recommendation? We said, <clears throat> decide in your parliament, yes or no, do you want a memorial to Europe's murdered Jews in Berlin? If you say yes, then decide yes or no. Do you want Peter Eisenman's design, which we've recommended here? And if yes, third, do you want to establish a place of information built underneath that will tell the story of the Holocaust so that you have both a museum underneath and a memorial on top? Very abstract memorial on top with very concrete story underneath. Yes or no? And finally, if you have all of this, do you want to establish a memorial foundation that will pay for all this? And so they voted it. They voted all four of them up. They agreed. They had the election. And then <clears throat> next thing you know, um, uh, Schroeder, of course, the, wins the election. The Social Democrats win. Michael Nauman becomes the culture minister for Schroeder. And then they're trying to put together a coalition. And they're saying, we're not going to build the monument. <clears throat> uh, but they go to make a coalition. And they get the head of the Green Party, <clears throat> Joschka Fischer. And to make a governing coalition and parliamentary democracy, um, you have to get enough members of parties to put together to have a, a ruling or governing coalition. And they needed Joschka Fischer and the Green Party to put together their governing coalition. Joschka Fischer agreed to join the coalition only on the condition that the memorial be built. So now he was stuck. To go ahead and make a governing coalition, they had to build the memorial. Joschka Fischer went on to become the foreign minister who eventually said, uh, while the memorial is under construction in 1999, <clears throat> that memory and memorials are not enough. Um, when asked by President Clinton to join the NATO forces against the Serbs who had now cornered the Kosovars um, in Kosovo, Albanian Muslims, uh, the last non-Christian population left in Europe, clearly they were about to massacre them, up to a million. It was quite clear it was a brand new genocide about to take place before everybody's eyes. And Joschka Fischer said, it's never enough only to remember, we must act. And as long as this memorial leads us to act, we'll go, we'll go forward with it. And so he actually volunteered the German Air Force for the first time to leave German soil after World War II and to take part in these strikes against the Serbs, which did stop a new genocide. So the memorial for Joschka Fischer was an inspiration to prevent a new genocide. It would not become a substitute for action, but became a call to action. And that was a crucial turning point you know, in Holocaust memory. It actually led to something else being stopped. So we have all this in mind. We've gone through this huge process. Um, it was dedicated, actually, uh, only in 2005, finally. But it was under construction. And it was under construction, actually, in 2001, during the 9-11 attacks. Here's I want to just show you the room underneath. It's uh, four rooms underneath with a museum. And they've designed it in such a way that they seem to allow the Shelley to come into the space underneath to define it. So there seems to be like this interpenetration of shapes above defined by the space below and vice versa, kind of like a yin-yang of memory above and history below, each underpinning and shaping the other, which is a, 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 great, a, a great design. And which also, I have to say, has inspired the National 9-11 Memorial and Museum, which is now the memorial 
is on top, the museum is now below, anchored in this history of the day. The museum, by the way, in Ground Zero is about to open uh, in May of this year. And this is how people use public spaces. It's not always pretty, but it was not our job to prescribe how people use them. And in fact, the kids do run out over the tops of these. Nobody likes it. Um, and there are rules, but short of putting a fence around this place or having guards to tell people what they can do and can't do, um, this, this will happen. And we record it, we take note, and go from there. see how we got to the end now. Um, <clears throat> September 11th, 2001, uh, Islamic extremists, 19 of them uh, take planes, fly them into the World Trade Center towers, into the Pentagon, and one plane is uh, crash in Pennsylvania, near Shanksburg, Shanksville. That's <clears throat> how the towers looked. The towers weren't especially loved by artists and architects, but the city came to live with them. And of course, this was a, a highly public attack. Um, thousands and thousands, millions of people on TV, hundreds of millions of people saw the second plane fly into the towers. <clears throat> the terror, of course, of the attack is usually reflected more in people's faces even than in the, the, the fire and the, the falling towers themselves. It was a highly personal attack in New York, if you lived there. You took it quite personally. Your landscape is now destroyed. Firefighters, 426 firefighters rushing to save people are now killed when they go up into the buildings as high as 80 stories to save people. And they, they're killed when they come, towers come down. So I was asked within three weeks of the attacks to come talk to the mayor and his staff and the governor and his staff about how to memorialize 9-11. And I went down because I'd lived in New York City for almost 20 years. At one point I was living in Amherst at the time. I you know, had small young children in Amherst. And, they, um, and I told them, you know, it, it's too early. It's not memory yet. We don't know what this means. In order to memorialize, you have to know, have a meaning to your memory. And the only people who have meaning in these attacks are the people who lost somebody. You know, they've lost loved ones, and they know what, that, what these attacks mean for them. But we don't know if this is the beginning of a long war. We, 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 we don't know. So I said, sit back, take a deep breath, think of a kind of a, and I gave them the example of a, um, a Jewish mourning year. Uh, a, lo a loved one dies in Jewish tradition, and for the first seven days, you sit Shiva. And people come visits, and mirrors are covered, and you think fondly of the lost loved one. The first month of mourning is called Shloshim, where men traditionally don't shave, you don't go to weddings, you don't have parties. You're continuing to mourn. You're still feeling the loss, internalizing the loss of the loved one. And a year after the passing, you erect a tombstone. <clears throat> you kind of externalize the loss. But it takes that year, it takes that pause to internalize this loss, go on living with it. Then you put a tombstone, you externalize it, put stones on it, and once a year you visit the tombstone, and, and you say a prayer for the dead. Um, you say Kaddish every day, you know, twice a day for a year as well. So it's, I just use this example for them just to sit back and realize that memory has already begun, and they don't have any control over it. And so I pointed to these um, candle light vigils, Washington Square, Union Square, Brooklyn Promenade, Brooklyn Heights. And so it's already begun in these candles, candlelight. The people have already begun memorializing. And they're remembering either friends, they're remembering the towers, they're remembering the sense of violation they felt, they're remembering the kind of America attacked, as the New York Times would put it. So I said, let these be your first memorials, and let the memorial itself not be a single static thing, but something you see over time. Think of the memorial as coming in stages. Think of the memorial, I said, <clears throat> in these, these flyers, thousands of these all over the city. And of course, 
the motif or the, the theme of these flyers was uncannily unified. Missing, absent, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my father? They give the names, they give who they were, who their children were. It was almost like tombstone epitaphs in paper all over the city, papering the city everywhere. Thousands of them. I said, these two are memorials. They're vernacular memorials. They're found memorials. Look at these. Hang on to them. Save them. Think of them as these people are looking for their lost loved ones and missing them. And missing became that motif. And so remember, we, this is a, a generation now that thinks of absence and voids and losses and missing as kind of their, it's already in them now. So when they go about designing a memorial, this is a preoccupation. Missing towers, missing people. At first there was a conflation between the missing people and the missing towers. Are we mourning the destroyed towers or the people in them? And I think there was some confusion at first. Towers, candles, burning towers, burning candles. There were all these, these, these um, kind of weird equations at first. The firefighters knew exactly what happened. <clears throat> they know that they went down there to save people, and they were killed. And the first questions they had, are we going to be remembered the same as everybody else? It's a valid question. And that was something we had to struggle with on the jury. <clears throat> Is there a difference between civic mourning and remembering somebody who died in the civic good, as the, as the firefighters did, quite heroically, and remembering people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you remember them differently, are you thereby creating a hierarchy of victims? And we had to ask that question among ourselves. And eventually it was resolved very well. In the memorial, firefighters and rescue workers who were killed are remembered by their ladder company numbers or by their uh, precinct numbers uh, in town. So that's all. They're just distinguished, but it's not creating this hierarchy. But in our minds, you know, we, we had to mark them. We had to show that they died in the civic good and not just, you know, as just being the complete innocent victims of a, of a terrorist attack. Throughout the first year, people wanted to, the memorial to be frozen. Make that the memorial. Wait, stop right there. That should be the memorial, you know, this destruction. And so, I was asked you know, to advise, and, and my advice was always let it unfold, let the repair go on. <clears throat> don't fix it, and don't use images of destruction as the memorial for victims. Remember these lives by how they lived and not by how they died. You know, if the terrorists themselves were to design a memorial, that's the memorial they would design. This is how they wanted to leave this site, and they succeeded. They did it. And if we leave that site as it is, <clears throat> that's the terrorist monument to their victims. Absolute destruction, no regard for how these people lived. So there was repair, but at every stage, there were critics and people who wanted to use the facade, make that the memorial. This is a perfect, this was just kind of accidentally left standing. Of course, the firefighters would see this as a perfect memorial. <clears throat> and in fact, this particular uh, cross uh, was salvaged <clears throat> and will probably in the next year or so be returned to the perimeter of the site. So again, this is done very carefully, but it did seem apropos. Um, so there are a couple, a couple emblems of destruction and clearly we were, um, we told everybody we would not choose anything with any religious significance here. Um, but certain traditions are going to remember in their traditions no matter what. On the six-month anniversary, a tribute in light was installed to remember the towers and the lives lost. As part of our final recommendation on the jury, um, we asked that these, uh, the tribute in light be shown every year on 9-11, which it has been and will continue to be. The first anniversary uh, was really only for the families of victims who came and read the names of their lost loved ones. Uh, bells chimed, the moment of 
first impact, a moment of second impact. Uh, one year after the attacks, the entire site was completely cleaned and two small reflecting pools were put in where victims' families would come and lay flowers after calling their loved one's name. You see the slurry walls here, which many credit with having kind of saved downtown New York by holding back the waters. Remember, uh, this whole area is complete landfill, <clears throat> and these slurry walls were built to hold back basically the waters of the harbor in the Hudson River. So every year, for the first 10 years, these reflecting pools would be built, names would be called, members would come down and drop their flowers. Um, already in 2003, in December, uh, there were two finalists uh, for the World Trade Center site uh, design, not the memorial, but the site design. One finalist team uh, by the Think Team, including Rafael Vignoli and Frederick Schwartz, proposed this kind of skeletal twin tower combination, which uh, many of the art, arts community and architects uh, liked very much, but the families hated. So Governor Pataki just said no. Said this looks like death, looks like a skeleton. This is not what, how we're going to rebuild the towers. <clears throat> Even though the towers, uh, part of his, their plan, they included these two voids, which is very interesting. Even though they were not asked to build memorials, they included the footprints articulated here. Daniel Liebeskind uh, won this competition uh, with his, what was called the, um, you know, vertical world gardens in the beginning, but really um, so-called Liberty Tower, <clears throat> in which, of course, he created um, a tower 1,776 feet high with an asymmetrical spire to echo the Statue of Liberty torch, quite prosaic. The families loved it. <clears throat> the governor liked it, and the governor said this is about life and liberty and, and rebuilding and not about death, so he chose this one. And the governor literally did it by executive decision. Of course, over the years, there was much modification, so the original design is almost nowhere to be seen. Liebeskind's design included leaving open this huge space <clears throat> into which um, the memorial was to be placed, which is a little bit problematic. Um, he actually encumbered the footprints, as you see here. This is a, on the far left. He put a cultural center right over the north footprint of the north, north tower. <clears throat> but now he was chosen, and then they set about doing a memorial competition. And in March, 19, or March 2003, um, I got a call from the governor's office um, asking if I would be on the jury um, for this. And I asked, um, who else? It's going to be on the jury. I said, well, we asked Maya Lynn. So I called Maya, and, and uh, <clears throat> we agreed that if one did it, the other one would do it. They asked several other people, great 